Welcome to Mama Fuel, the podcast that fuels every mama's heart, soul, mind, and body, and hopefully sparks a few dreams along the way. I'm Ann Ferguson, Chief Nurturer and Mama Mentor at The Centered Mama Project, and your host for this podcast. I'll be sharing real, raw, and often funny conversations with beautiful mamas from around the world to remind you that you're not alone and that you're doing amazingly on this wild journey of being a gorgeous woman shepherding small humans as they make their way on our beautiful planet. Let's get started. Hello and welcome to today's episode of Mama Fuel, the podcast. I am Ann Ferguson, your host, and today I have something really special for you, someone really special for you. Edie Hoffman and I met through a group that was being run by Natasha Vanzetti, who, if you've been listening for a while, you will have heard on episode number nine, where we were talking about what rules your life, the stories that you have learned and assimilated and taken on through your life, or the ones that you decide to replace them by and consciously live by. And Edie and I connected because she's lovely. And also because she had a conversation in that group with Tash about cognitive health. Mm -hmm. And every single part of that conversation made me think, if I replace the word entrepreneur with the word mom, we could be talking about mothers. And I thought, I need to share this conversation and this incredible knowledge that Edie has. So Edie is a social anthropologist by training and life through its many twists and turns has brought her to the UK. And I'll let her tell us all about that, where she now helps families of people and the people themselves who have Alzheimer's and other forms of dementia to live the best life they possibly can. Isn't that amazing? It's so cool. And today, Edie and I are going to talk about cognitive health, so the health of our brains, and how that affects how we live, how we interact with others, and how we show up as moms. I cannot wait to share this conversation with you, and I am so thrilled that you're here. Edie, thank you for joining us today. Hi, thank you. Thanks for having me. I'm looking forward to it. Ah, Such a pleasure. Okay, so I always start off the podcast by asking for you to tell us a little bit about what your life looks like right now. Mm. Okay, so I'm an American who married a Scotsman. Uh, so if you've seen Outlander, yes, that's what I married. <laughs> uh, Ooh, lucky you. Cool. Yeah, <laughs> lucky me. And he moved me to Glasgow, which was awesome. Um, and then we moved on to Cambridge, England, where we've settled. And yeah, I'm, I have a very fortunate life. I love what I do. I completely ran into it by accident. Um, I was a social anthropologist and community organizer, program manager in the States. Um, But when we moved to Scotland, we moved to support my husband's mom, who'd been diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease at the very young age of 56. And she really was the first person I'd ever met with uh, a level of senility or uh, cognitive impairment, which I think was a good thing um, because it meant I started with a clean slate. And I started with a clean slate in knowing her. I knew her just as she was, no baggage, no history. So I really could just enjoy her company. And she liked me. So that was a plus too. Score. So yeah, it really was because we connected and I became one of her care partners in this experience and really just learned as much as I could to support her. And because I'm an anthropologist rather than a clinician, I'm not looking at reducing actions and behaviors down to what's not working, I'm looking at what systems are working and how can I build those back up. Mm. So working that way meant do as much res- kind of uh, research as I could about what dementia was, but also what it wasn't, because I was certainly seeing things in her that were highlighting abilities and highlighting things that she could do. Mm. And anytime her stress was low, she could do more. So could we make that, you know, every day? Mm. And that just kind of morphed into naturally when we moved to England and we're supporting her from a distance, incorporating people with dementia in any kind of volunteering I was doing at the time or activities. And then I went on to specifically work with people with dementia. Um, And then I studied it. And then I got sick and tired of being sick and tired of the programs that were available. So I started my own. So I run a nonprofit called Dementia Compass, and I've done that for eight years. And we do amazing things. We reconnect families 
uh, with one another who've been disconnected. We help people reclaim activities, so we put things back on their bucket list. Mm. And we, can, we actually extend lives because we can reduce the symptoms which take the toll on lives. So people have been in my program for much longer than um, anticipated or evidence would um, project. And, and now I'm helping families um, on a kind of greater level. I've started helping families in the U.S. as well as the U.K. who are not in my program. And that's how you and I met, was how can I look at getting this message out more broadly and um, more sustainably. Yeah. I love it. I love it. And, and there, I have a personal interest in this because my father's mom, so my paternal grandmother, was diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease in her 70s. And I remember very, very vividly grandma, grandma's decline and the ways that grandpa used to, he was so loving and kind and I have goosebumps just thinking about it. I adored him. And the ways that he would accommodate her loss of, of memory of, you know, the little post-it notes beside the the light switch that said, this is the light switch for the kitchen. And, you know, gently taking her dinner plate out of the washing machine because that's not where it went. It went in the dishwasher. And, you know, he did so much for her for so long. Um, And eventually she ended up in care. And as a young person in my early 20s, that was really traumatic to see this, you know, this pillar of... um, of restraint and of of strength and of determination and the maker of the best apple pies <laughs> crisscross tops ever mm-hmm. you know grandma was an amazing cook and she she just she was a great you know she was a golfer and she played bridge and she did all this stuff and then my memories of her at the end are they're so poignant and they're connected to the smells that I remember from being in in the hospice and connected to the sounds that I remember and 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 her eyes and, you know, I, at the end, and it just was so far removed from, um, from the person that I grew up knowing and loving. And, and so knowing that you do this kind of work and particularly that you work with families, and we've talked about this ourselves separately before about how people don't really know how to behave and grandkids don't know how to behave. And what about the, you know, people in our generation who have the parents who are getting ill and who have the kids. And so let's maybe wheel it all back, (laughs) come way back and say, okay, for people who aren't clinicians and aren't Mm -hmm. social anthropologists or aren't in this field, which is most people, including me, can you explain what cognitive health is? Because we know about our physical health. We are hearing, thankfully, finally, more and more about mental health. Maybe we talk about emotional health. Health, mm-hmm. I can't even say it, health. <laughs> <laughs> what, is, <laughs> what is cognitive health? Yeah, so our ability to do things in our brain is something that we have taken for granted, right? It comes instinctively for us. Uh, we are constantly building through life on the things that we experienced in yesterday and the years before. And it's a fantastic filing cabinet that way. Our mm. brain is constantly storing things in anticipation that we might need it someday and to inform those decisions. And I think because we are, we're able to understand dementia a little bit better and understand a little bit more about what's happening and we're living longer. So we're seeing more of it. So we're we as professionals are seeing more of it so we can talk, we have better words for it. Um, We're recognizing that cognition is something that is something lifelong. We produce neurons all our lives, uh, even to the day we die, regardless of whether or not we have dementia. And our brains are constantly working, even in the late stages of dementia, always. They're our secret weapon. Mm -hmm. But we often don't talk about it because it's so instinctive that we don't actually kind of claw it back and say, okay, what worked and what didn't? What often instead we do is see what didn't work. <laughs> and, and then if you're framed in and around a family member with dementia, we often then say, is that me? Is, is that, do I have that? Is that a sign? And, and actually we know that our lives are so full right now that it's not necessarily. Mm-hmm. And more than likely it's overload. And so looking at cognitive abilities on a spectrum is really valuable, right? Because you can have cognitive overload on this side, but you can have really good cognitive health on this side. And ideally we all want to be here. Sure. On the cognitive health side. Yeah. Yeah. And we're learning more and more about how diet and sleep and stress affect those 
ways that our brain is working. Mm -hmm. And so then how can we take better care of those? And for me, that's really important when you're working intergenerationally for families, Mm -hmm. because as you take on more stress and as you're hearing more about kind of the media and how they're framing dementia as being something really terrible and um, research is saying that there's nothing that we can do for it right now. And we haven't really tapped, we, everything that we seem to take a step forward to, we end up taking two steps back and that can really be more fear-based mm. than informed based. So it gets tricky. And statistically speaking, we all know someone with a cognitive impairment. Totally. And when I say cognitive impairment, I mean someone who's experiencing a regular level of cognitive impairment that's getting in the way of their everyday things. Mm. Some of us, those that are diagnosed, aren't able to repair or kind of compensate that as much as they used to be able to. And so it's really important to recognize that cognitive impairment is when things aren't working, Mm. right? So you and I, things aren't working when we can't find our keys, (laughs) but we can remedy it. No problem, right? We can back up our steps and do it. If we are making a cup of tea or coffee and we're sleep deprived and we pour the coffee into the cup or the container without, sorry, the water into something without the coffee or the tea, and then we're drinking hot water and wondering what we've done wrong, (laughs) we can back up and fix it. A person living with cognitive impairment can't necessarily. Their brain isn't able to do some of the problem solving steps to fix it. So, It's important to recognize, gosh, how many times have I said important? I don't know. It's still important to recognize that cognitive health and cognitive impairment, that spectrum, is is really what we're living with all the time. We are able to repair it, and those with dementia cannot. I think as a mama, (laughs) Mm -hmm. um, and I've shared this with you before, because of this family history of of Alzheimer's disease and because at one point the studies were pointing to the fact that Alzheimer's disease skipped a generation and therefore that put me straight in the line of fire and I look a lot like my dad and he was a lot like my grandmother in build and facially and I just put those two things together and thought, ergo, I must be even more likely to be in this situation. And it is something, so she would have been 20... How old she have been? She would have been, I would have been about 17, 18 when she was diagnosed and she passed away when I was in my late twenties. And since then I have this routine little like, oh, is this, is this the beginning? Oh, mm-hmm. something, oh, you know, and I, I once went to see my family doctor to say to her, I actually think I'm, and even the languaging around it is awful. I actually think I'm losing my mind. Like I think it, it's not working. What is wrong? My mind isn't working. And she just quietly smiled at me and said, you're a mom of two (laughs) little kids under the age of five and you're alone with them all the time and you nursed them for two and a half years. And you know, you're just, you are really tired. And I notice, I catch myself thinking that until I became a mom, I used to pride myself on never, ever, ever forgetting anything. I would remember conversations. I would remember where they happened. Who said what? In what order? What time of day? What the birds were saying? How the wind was blowing? Like everything. I would remember all the things. Not really useful, but (laughs) I was remembering all the things. And as I became a mama and time has gone on, like it's, I'm 11 years in almost, the brain, my brain is just, and because I'm not a great sleeper, I know the benefits of sleep and we'll talk about that. But I historically have not been a phenomenal sleeper. And I think when you put hypervigilance, a tendency to anxiety, protracted lack of sleep, and this over-responsibility of wanting to make sure everybody's okay all the time, and that's three people, including myself. My brain, like my cognitive health has suffered. I'm conscious of it on a very real level. So can you talk a little bit about about, um, cognitive load and how that works? Because I think my cognitive load... And every single mama's cognitive load is mahoosive. <laughs> it is. And it's, it's complex, right? It's not simple. There's not any easy way of unscrewing a part of that and making it simple, mm-hmm. right? And I think that's one of the amazing things about parenthood is, so I'm not a mom, but I certainly am able to watch people create families and build them and mm-hmm. recognize that there are so many integrated parts to that. It's not simple. 
And we sometimes simplify it because it's a biological ability and therefore it should just happen and we should just be good at it. But actually, there are so many things that we're expecting to insert and not insert, right? How many of us have said, I'm never going to do what my mom did under that situation or my dad. That's not going to be a part of my family. And that's the brain saying, I'm going to make these choices that are going to inform and protect and create something great, right? We're, I think we're in some ways, especially in the Western world, constantly working towards development. Mm. So we're developing something. So we're always trying to move forward. And we get kind of frustrated sometimes when we take steps back. Right, because it's the prefrontal cortex going, I like the front part of my brain over my eyeballs for people who can't see me <laughs> is going, yes, I'm going to be different in these ways from things that I've seen and models that I've had. Because what we have is the models we have, right? And we also have the genetic programming of the people who came before us. So like it or not, little chickens, we have the stuff that we have for better or for worse. And so your prefrontal brain is all like, I'm gonna, I've got this under control. Like, we're going to be different and we're going to, I'm, I'm going to be peaceful and calm all the time. <laughs> and I just, before we started our conversation, was explaining to you that I slightly lost my bananas in the car because it was, it was just too much. And I was really clear with my kids about something that I didn't, that was outside of the realm of my desire to speak to them about a subject. And, and what happens, like the prefrontal cortex is all boss, like I'm, I got this covered. We're going to be so much better and we're going to do all these things. Right. And then your reptilian brain at the back, which is your emotional brain, which is your emotional brain. And you're like, I'm going to keep you safe brain. And I'm going to love you. And I want to be, be, I want to be included. And I want everyone to feel belonging. Yeah. Yeah, All that good stuff. That kicks in. And then you find yourself yelling like somebody who you don't even know because child A is doing X to child B or somebody was going to run across the street and a car was coming and you like react in a way that surprises and maybe frightens you. Like that you're, you're like the frontal cortex talks a good game, but (laughs) it's not, it's not much of a match. I find 11 years in still super conscious and doing all the work it still isn't much of a match for the, the guy back there. No, because we, we have a lot of demands for our prefrontal. So if we look at the prefrontal as our black and white, so let, let's actually, let's build it up. So you have a whole set of Legos, right? Yeah. Okay. And you've got black and white Legos, right? So really clear cut information, decision-making, um, scheduling is one of those things that happens in your prefrontal. So you knew that you had an appointment and you were trying to get your kids home. So mm-hmm. all the while the prefrontal is going, what time is it? Do you have, yep. are, you, are you doing things? What's going on? I got to keep you on target. And this is all black and white. There's really no negotiation with time, no negotiation with this is what I de- define as success or family or any of those things. They're really concrete. They're really black and white. Mm-hmm. Our reptilian brain, our emotional centers are colorful. They're sometimes bright red when things aren't working. And there's all sorts of stuff going on, right? And it's high emotion. Ideally, you want all the colors going on back there because that's the richness that life and family brings us. But that's not always every day. Some days are going to be blue, right? Because we've all had blue days. Some days are going to be really serene, kind of greens and lavenders and how fab is that? And there will be other days where all of your Legos are red. Mm-hmm. And, that's, and you're stepping on them and that hurts. It does. And there's conflict because red is usually when there's been a breakdown in communication and breakdown in needs getting met. Mm-hmm. And so your brain is trying to negotiate your own needs and your own sense of safety and security with somebody else's, for example. So I get to work with this when it comes to dementia. When things break down for a family and there might be signs of aggression or heated conversations, it's usually when communication has broken down. People aren't getting their needs met. So if we take a step back and we say, okay, what are the needs now? Okay, wait, actually someone's running a fever. Mm -hmm. And so that need is taking the priority over any of the other things that are supposed to be happening. Let's fix the fever. Let's Mm -hmm. fix the infection. And then actually we can lower all that, those red Legos that are trying to protect us Mm -hmm. and make something that's really beautiful, a nice rainbow of colors. Mm -hmm. Because otherwise, You just get red and red and red because we continue to try and protect ourselves. And that's when relationships break down because Mm -hmm. we don't, we can't effectively communicate to get our needs met. 
And that happens, that happens on a, sorry, that happens on an ongoing basis in families. And in our family, we talk about it as the hot potato, like somebody, you know, good mood is just as contagious as bad mood and frustration is just as contagious as <laughs> bad mood and yeah. good mood. And, and so we'll talk about like today after our call, I'm going to go down and talk to the kids and I'll have a conversation with them and say, you know, I took a hot potato and passed it on. You know, there was some pressure from this situation and I caught the hot potato and instead of being the adult and putting it down and naming feelings and, you know, everyone having their own place, this always happens in the car. We don't have a lot of space to get away from each other mm. and takes time and space, but especially in traffic, but is to, is to, you know, to have those conversations because it is that like red, 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 red. And it's, it's like, <laughs> it's like, um, chicken pox. <laughs> it just goes from one brain to the other brain and we all get into this red Right. Sure. Be, well, and especially, so if we want to talk about cognitive load, mm, yeah, we're constantly evaluating our surroundings and the people in them mm-hmm. or where we fit in and how we do that successfully. And so if you're in a space where other people are angry, you're reading the body language, the tone of voice, the facial expressions, even before people's words come out. Mm-hmm. So most of our communication is nonverbal, even as adults. Mm-hmm. And so for us, there, people are already anticipating something coming out that may not be savory and protecting ourselves, right? And that's when you get a bunch of people trying to protect themselves because their needs aren't in line. You get kind of these huge breakdowns, right? You get these chimneys of smoke and you get all this outburst. And I'll just point out, because we often don't think about it, cars are a really funny place cognitively. Cars are an extension of our bodies in many ways because we can use our muscle memory to to maneuver in them as we drive. But they're also a place of high, tense decision-making and negotiation with the outside cars. So our brains are working really hard to make this work. That's so interesting. And then we try to have an emotional conversation. I can't tell you how many times I've dropped bombs on my husband on drives. Can we talk (laughs) about this deep and, you know, existential thing? And he's like, no, not really. No, don't really. <laughs> want to do it. Yeah. And it's not. And, and I, it's the first place I can get him to kind of just have a total meltdown in front of me. Right. Cause it's like, there's just too much going on. This is, I'm not meant for this thing. And it's like, oh, sorry. I should, I should remember that driving isn't something that we should take for granted. Right. It, it can be soothing and beautiful if we're in beautiful places, but if we're in traffic, that's just not the case. And we're in traffic. It's after school. Everybody's hungry yeah, and a little bit angry. Like, the Legos little going hangry, on in the, the Legos. It's just like, yeah, we're sitting on Legos, not like <laughs> on the pointed part of Legos. Yeah. My feet are on the Legos on the pedal. Yeah. That's a really, that's a really, really interesting um, aspect, which as you've been saying, it's a perfect illustration of we don't think about our cognitive health. Like what demands am I putting on my brain? Which is a really good segue into something I wanted to raise with you which is that not long ago, I read an article about how, and, the, and there were funny sort of deprecating memes that were running around the internet, running, it sounds like they're actually got their sneakers, <laughs> that, were, that were making their rounds around the internet, around, um, around the emotional load that women carry and the organizational load that we carry so that even if you're in a relationship with someone who is, carrying his half of the parenting, right? It's not that he's helping you when you go out for an evening and know my husband's helping, he's babysitting, you know, he's parenting. Um, It's like a bugbear of mine. Um, But, you know, even if you're lucky enough to have someone who is doing what I think they should be doing, frankly, which is to be an equal parent, it still falls. Studies are showing that it still falls to the mom and sure as heck is the case in our family because my husband travels largely, mm-hmm. and because I'm the native language speaker here, um, to think about all the appointments, to have that constant stream of like, when I get home, I got to do the laundry and then I've got to do this and then I've got to, oh, I got to remember to get that permission slip signed because otherwise she won't be able to go to the sailing camp. And then I need to do the, oh gosh, yeah, I got to take the dog out and I call the dog walker. Ooh, when we go on holiday, I need to make sure that the dog's going up to the mountains. Gotta, it's that constant, constant, constant churn of all of the things that don't even get to the to-do list. They're just this like, it's like swimming in treacle of constant, you know, it's a constant progression of, and the more children you have, or the more special situations you have, special in the sense of anything, anything that's even slightly outside perfectly okay (laughs) to me qualifies as a special situation. It feels like it gets harder. Yeah. And I, I don't actually think we're served by being euphemistic about it. 
Yeah. You know, it, it doesn't serve us to be um, downplaying some of the stuff that we encounter. That's not good for our cognitive load because it's not good for our emotional health and our sense of identity, I think, too. Mm. I don't think it's actually not that different for me as a non-mom. There's still, and I might actually, so instead of emotional load in this case, I would say it's emotional labor Mm. because we're actively working to manage a variety of things going on. And the the labor part of it is it, it's not, ideally the labor should be something that we can split. You take this and I'll take this. And then we're truly co-partners in this industry or endeavor that we've got going. Um, if we're not careful, and I think that's what the research is saying, is it can put us at a level of fatigue mm-hmm. that breaks us down, mm-hmm. that actually doesn't serve us. In and, a very real physical and mental way. Yeah, absolutely. And, and it hurts our relationships too, because you end up having these inequalities that are harder and harder to kind of rectify, maybe, mm-hmm. and create something that actually serves us better. Because I think as 21st century women, we know the capacity for having a good relationship, Mm -hmm. but our role modeling hasn't necessarily been to that, towards that goal, right? So the the moms and aunts and grandmothers and things, they were, part of their identity was to hold on to that emotional labor Mm -hmm. so that the dad could work, Mm -hmm. right? And he could use his prefrontal cortex, his decision-making to the best of the earning capability to Mm -hmm. serve his identity. And now I think we're, we've placed so many demands on ourselves with so many opportunities that we really have to be under kind of, we have to better understand ourselves and what we can really take on as labor. So mm-hmm. this labor for me is emotional labor, physical labor, right? The lifting and the, and the managing, the hauling and the doing all of that sort of physical stuff, mm-hmm. the cognitive labor of decision-making of yes. managing a variety of different lives and a variety of different choices and then emotional labor of how are we going to respond to those needs that everybody has present. And often for women, because we're seen as, and I, I love this, because we're seen as a natural at that, we'll take it on. And often for me, I, I kind of, for, I fill the vacuum for my husband. Mm. I, you know, I, if I don't say, I'm, I'm not going to do that today. He can do that. He's perfectly capable. He has space. He's his intention is to take it. I can't take that for him. I can't do that. I have to leave space for him to do it. Because mm-hmm. otherwise, without that vac, without, so let's see, with that vacuum or without that vacuum, I don't know how to use that phrase. Um, without the vacuum. Thank you. Nature abhors the vacuum. So without the vacuum, yeah. he won't step in and do the thing. Yeah. And yeah. that affects his identity. The challenge with that though, is that's my emotional labor working to balance the relationship. Yeah. He's not thinking, oh, I need to step in because this is, an, this is an equality issue in our relationship. Yeah. In fact, I don't think he'll ever really think <laughs> that. And he would admit it. Um, but he has the intention. And yeah. so for me, it's, it's practicing, right? And this is one of the things that the brain is really good at. Practicing a behavior until it's learned that creates success. And this is no different when you have dementia as when you're parenting children or managing a relationship. There's all relationships where if you give someone space to do something and they get, and then give them a chance to repeat it, the brain is, it wants to succeed because it wants to be included because it knows that that's a possible possibility. So that has just prompted a question, which isn't on my list of 462 things I want to ask you about. Um, and I don't know if it's in your, in your wheelhouse. So if it's not, please, please say so. But it suddenly strikes me that children come home from school, right? An environment where they have no control, mm-hmm. where they're allowed almost no choice, unless they're very lucky to be in a, in a more progressive um, environment um, or homeschooled or whatever the situation might be. They come home from school exhausted, frustrated often because they've had to contain themselves to adhere to the rules of the class of each particular adult that they're around because every one of them has different expectations and different, you know, parameters. And then they come into the environment of home where we also grownups have different parameters and different expectations. But usually, often, not always, there is some sort of pressure release Mm 
Mm -hmm. either in the form of huge tears or in the form of a spat or in the form of refusal to whatever and things blow up and you think, whoa, where did that come from? Can we talk a little bit about children's brains and how the cognitive, no, but really like how <laughs> you're laughing, but how, how they are cognitively, because we are, we like actually physically can see in the brains of children that some parts are big and strong and powerful at some points. And then in adolescence, some parts are like, <sighs> and other parents are doing all the work yeah. and, and it really affects what they're actually capable of and what we should expect of them. So can we talk about cognitive health in little people? Yeah, well, and I think it, I, I actually think little people aren't that different from big people, okay, aren't cool. that different from teenagers and aren't that different from older adults, especially those with cognitive impairment. We are all trying to master the load in front of us. Mm. And one of the things that we are really good at is putting our private, our private faces in our pockets and our public faces on when we go out to face the world. Mm. And that public face costs us calories. We're actively working to evaluate the landscape around us and the people involved and trying to figure out how we succeed. We're built to succeed. And that takes a toll on people. So if I take a person out with dementia into a new environment, I will often say to family, the next day is a rest day because there's been so much taken in, so much information to manage that you and I would manage fairly easily because we have a lot of experience that we can access. The rest day is really important for that person. It is no different for a child or a teenager, right? Because if we take them out and there's a lot of demand on their cognition, as well as their physical and emotional activities, there has to be a rest space Mm. where the brain can, in some ways, continue to work because it's carrying on to categorize all the information that they've learned in that day Mm -hmm. so that they can pull it next time. And rest is one of those places where the brain is categorizing for next time. That's why we sleep. In many ways, we are, the brain is active, um, not resting, but preparing you for tomorrow. So it's looking through all the information and saying, okay, what do I, what do I think I need? Mm. How do I categorize it? I don't categorize it in just one place. I categorize it in many places. So it's going to be stored in a variety of different parts of my brain to access later. So it might be that there's an emotional element to the day, a cognitive level, a decision-making level, a way of connecting with people, all those different things that we do. And the brain wants to reserve that information to pull out later. Mm. And when you think about kids in school, they're taking on all of that information with their public faces on, evaluating how to succeed. And then when they come home or they climb into the car where it's safe, Yeah then it's an opportunity to let that public face down and put their private face on. And sometimes that's when things melt down. Even for me, if I come yeah. home and I'm really tired, if my husband's at the door saying, okay, we're supposed to do X, I may not be there to yeah. actually be as successful as he wants me to be and vice versa, right? Yeah. So, but we have this expectation that we should be able to, we're resilient enough to flip the switch and be somewhere else successfully and be somewhere else successfully and be somewhere else successfully. I think we underestimate the power of a nap. Mm-hmm. Yes. It's certainly coming out in the research around teenagers really needing a lot more sleep because there, there's a surge of emotion. There's a surge of development, body and brain. Mm, yeah. And there's the demands of the Western world to be adult. And yeah. to succeed and to be included in their social set, sets they're and all not, those things. They're not yet. Well, and brains develop and grow until we're 23 or 24, which is terrible news for a teenager because I'd like to think that it, they're all set, right? Totally. Remember, I remember being 17 <laughs> and moving away to university and being all like, I got this. Cover. I got it. Huh? Yeah. I got it. I'm grown and, up. And actually looking back, we didn't, did we? <laughs> well, yeah. we had enough to manage, but, but yeah. yeah. But there a, was a lot more development happening. Yeah. And we often, I think, underestimate what our bodies need to actually fuel our brains. So this is a, a really interesting question that I'm going to kind of, I'm going to flip because I usually ask all of my guests, where, my guests, my guests, where they get their, where they get their mama fuel and whether you are a mama or not. And it is exceptional for me to have somebody on who's not a mama. Mm-hmm. Um, but 
everything that you share is so, so relevant to every single mama who's got us in her beautiful earbuds that I, I just had to have you on and, and sharing this, sharing this knowledge. But where do you, where do you get your fuel? I mean, you know, all of this stuff about the brain. So what do you do to, as I'm like literally pen in hand about to <laughs> scribble this down, what do you do? I'm hitting the microphone. The kids are having a bath. There's going to be noise around us. life. Um, but what do you do to, to, to fuel yourself and to make sure that cognitively you are healthy? So I may not be a mom, but I am a caregiver yes. in my job. Yes. So I'm actively putting my public face on, but I also have to have my reptilian brain on working really strongly too, because that's how I can often connect with a person with dementia and their families. Mm. So I have to be aware that when I'm done working, I need space to recharge and, and disconnect a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I take some notes, but then I take a nap. And I, I am the biggest advocate of a nap app on your phone Ooh. that you can choose for 20 minutes to just turn off and when, then wake up happy. And the more you practice naps, it's the better you. they get. I know. <laughs> Isn't it good? Oh, it's and, so good. And understanding. So for me, I mean, people with dementia teach me every day about what is universally human and then what is the disease. Mm. And I come home and, you know, I'm, it's very likely that a lot of us are going to live over a hundred. We're not actively living that way yet. And we're not actively thinking that way. We're kind of in the moment. I wish that we weren't necessarily as afraid, as afraid of aging as we are often. Mm. Because in any way, in, in a lot of ways, we're investing in our future. You know, we're investing in how physically fit we are. Or we're investing in our relationships or our careers. We actually need to be investing in our kind of aging plan. What is this next period of our lives going to look like? And it's, you know, it could be 50, 60 years. I know. It's not amazing. But it is. It's really exciting. But that actually means that we really need to be taking good care of ourselves. And taking good care of ourselves right now is really exciting because we know so much more than your grandparents did. Yeah. And we can talk more actively about it. It doesn't have to be just talking about the end in air quotes, Mm. Uh, but actually the two decades often that we're managing um, frailties of some level because of general wear and tear that we've earned now. Right. Yeah. So for me, it's about, okay, what kind of wear and tear are we doing now? And what can I do to invest in myself right now to make that happen? And I do a variety of things because, hey, I'm American, right? <laughs> so there, it's a lot about learning the latest about diet and mm. what diet means and what, do, what are the, the foods that we really can benefit from mm. and understanding that we are each unique and that men or women are, are unique. So as women, we need a different diet than men do. As women, we need a different level of exercise than men do. And the more we can learn about those sorts of things, the more we benefit cognitively as well as physically and emotionally. They're making more and more links about our cognitive health being fueled by how we live in our 30s, 40s, and 50s as women and how we manage our emotional health and our physical bodies. And so more sleep. More sleep is good, but actually just being smart about sleep. So mm. if you're not a sleeper, capture some naps. Make sure that you get good levels of sleep. And that's where the, the apps can be really fun because they're starting to get really good at recording mm. what kind of sleep we have at night. And for me, that's really great information about if I didn't sleep that night the night before, then making sure that I get naps in. If I had a good four or five hour block where I was in good deep sleep, then beautiful. I don't maybe need a nap. Mm. Or if I'm going into landscapes that are new and I'm pushing my own boundaries, whether it's extroverted or introverted or in environments where I don't feel like um, that I might feel like I'm an imposter, Mm. recognizing that maybe my body and brain need a bit of of a rest, a recharge after something like that. But also social systems are really important. This is actually one of those areas that I think we have to master because social media is awesome in so many ways. It provides things like this. Yeah. How great is that? And the opportunity to, like, I've never met you, but I've met you. But we will. Yeah. But then not to discount the power of a hug. Because every time we hug, we release brain chemistry that is good and healthy and happy for us. And And how long does that hug have to be? Because you told me. 
yeah, how long does the hug need to be for those chemicals to start flooding? So scientists are saying six to nine seconds, which is the longest and most a social hug. So you just have to hold good. on for dear life because they're desperately trying to get away. You don't want to be hugging your post person this way. <laughs> like, hello, postman, postwoman. But actually it can be something like just contact. Every mm-hmm. time we touch our skin, it's releasing some chemistry. It's so I touch my own hand, it's releasing the chemistry. You know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't discount it um, because we can give ourselves goose pimples, right? Which is totally. the same sensation. It's yep. one of the reasons why I think, um, and I hope that research kind of brings this into the forefront in the years to come, but I think it's one of the reasons why music is so beneficial. Mm. It's because we literally feel it yeah. on our skin and that releases the brain chemistry that allows us to fight depression and to become more resilient mm. and to connect with people. So it's about really looking at um, all of the different ways that feed us and then actively putting on our to-do list and not forgetting about them, not discounting them and realizing that it's been weeks since something happened, right? Yes, which takes me right back to something that's one of my favorite topics, which is healthy selfishness. Like we have care the the care and keeping of yourself has such a bad rap such a bad rap and i even myself know you know how many times have you heard people say oh, i can't believe she's left her children to go away for the weekend with friends or i can't believe she's whatever whatever well, it, you know yeah it's not just moms it's caregivers too yes like how could she do that is that's so insensitive that's so selfish and if you think about it all the words that they're describing are emotional words Yes. They're all words that are judgmental um, triggers, right, for us. Yeah. And so I, for me, it's, it is judgmental, but it, it's about recognizing what serves us when yeah. it comes to those things. Because we are our best expert in what's best, you know, kind of, we, we will always be learning. Mm. We know deep down what we need. And if it's not being in the house all the time, and yep. we have to really listen to that, right? It doesn't work. And that applies to our parents. If they're caregivers, yeah. they need breaks. Respite is important. Yes. But actually, there, we can look at... So respite, traditionally, um, has, is kind of framed in, in my world as separating two people. Respite mm. from another. Yeah. But actually, we know more about respite than ever before. We know that respite is actually separating ourselves from the stress or yeah. the stressor right? Mm -hmm. It doesn't necessarily mean that we have to take ourselves to the spa to get our needs met. Mm -hmm. It can actually be just removing ourselves into another space that feels good. So in my program, I work with both the person with dementia and the caregiver. And they work together with the idea that they're actually experiencing respite from the dementia, not from each other. So beautiful. It is pretty cool. And I love it. But I think we all, we could all learn from that a bit. Mm-hmm. Right? Because we have a tendency to think, if I dig deep, I can tolerate a little bit more. Yeah. It's, it's fine. I'm, I'm supposed to do this. I signed up for this. So yeah. therefore, I should take it on. And those are messages that we, you know, they serve us in some situations, like life or death situations, <laughs> but not necessarily every day. We have to be, I think, more responsible as adults and parents, to be honest, mm-hmm. of what's chronic. What's persistent stuff that is, we're not tending to. Yeah. And if like it's persistent. fatigue or yeah. irritability or because there are lots of ways that the brain is telling you, I mean, let's even just, we can't really, but let's leave the body aside for a second because the body will often, as a yoga teacher say, she whispers and then she starts to talk if you're not listening. And if you still don't listen, she starts yelling. And if you still don't yeah. listen, she will stop you in your tracks and sometimes for good. And I think it's the same I don't think, I, I know that it's the same where I find myself saying things and my mouth and my brain aren't collaborating. Like what I want to say, instead of saying, you know, hey, next weekend, let's make sure that we, let's get out for a hike. I'll say, hey, next popsicle, can we go to the fridge or something? And my kids are like, what? <laughs> what? What? And I'll just, and I will catch, like, as it's coming out of my mouth, I'm going, that's not what I meant to say. What? How did, whoa, where did that happen? And then I'll come back and go, I mean that. What I meant to say was next weekend, well, where that came from, obviously I want some popsicles. Let's go for a hike next weekend. But it's, there are these flags that come up of not just the yawning and not just the, the, the physical manifestations, but the actual 
11 years of hypervigilance, 11 years of being anxious because that's part of my makeup, 11 years of wanting everybody to get along, 11 years of trying to make the best decisions for everybody and having that decision fatigue. I'm really noticing in the last couple of years that that kind of stuff is happening. And that to me are, is a huge red flag of get more sleep, eat better foods. I do pretty well on the food front, but the sleep part is my... So what do you do for food? What do I do for food? I Right now I'm fasting. So I fast um, 16 hours and eat eight. Although I've slightly slipped off that in the last week and I can really feel a difference physically and also mm-hmm. mentally and behaviorally. Like I'm a little bit more snappy than I was when I was really fasting. Um, and that felt really, really good. And what I noticed was my brain felt, my mind felt clearer. I also stopped eating refined sugar. Mm-hmm. Um, a year ago, completely on a whim, just was like, oh, I wonder what it would be like if I didn't eat sugar. And same, my brain just went, ah, <laughs> it was like, it's like it just had, you know, the brain equivalent of mouthwash. It's like, ah, yeah, great, great feeling. Um, and I eat a lot of vegetables and a lot of, a lot of fruit. We probably eat a lot more, we eat a lot more meat than I'd like to, um, because of a whole bunch of digestive things that make it impossible for me to not eat, to, to mm. eat legumes and, and all this stuff that I would, and eggs, I can't eat that kind of stuff. So I can't replace the protein very easily. And one of my kids doesn't eat fish. And so it just, mm-hmm. it, as a family, we're just, unfortunately, even though all of us would like to avoid meat, we don't. Um, so I'm going to call you on that because I think you're doing really great and you are responding to dietary norms in your family, right? Yeah. And doing what's necessary. And in the 21st century world that we live in as, as, and as expats, mm. we have access to food differently than we grew up with. Totally. So I think in some ways it's, wow, look at all the different ways that you're gearing your family for success. Thank and sure, you. we fall off the list. Yeah. But it's really about recognizing each of us has some different needs, right? Yeah. And I think... I can totally relate to the, what you're describing about diet and food and, and some of the things that don't work. For me, dehydration is a big one. Yes. When oh, my dude. world falls apart. Giant yeah. glass of water right here. And I forget. Yep. And so then suddenly my words and language change and I'm talking about popsicles. And yeah. it's like, wait, what's going on there? And for me, it's one of those lessons about, oh, that's how cognitive impairment works, Mm. right? That the brain wants to succeed, but doesn't have the access to information fast enough. Mm. And so goes for the nearest win. Oh, so interesting. So learning lesson, right? Okay, so something's not working in reflection because we don't have cognitive impairment, we can back up and say, oh, okay, actually that's probably the sleep, the food, the drink, whatever it is that my body triggers for those things. Okay, I'll fix those. And we're learning more about how women deal with stress differently Mm -hmm. than men and how sometimes we need different dietary requirements, especially in our cycles Mm -hmm. and recognizing those rather than pushing through to be just like everyone else. Mm -hmm. I think sometimes the messages that we've incorporated for success don't serve us anymore totally or don't true. serve us now. Maybe they'll serve us later. And actually we can count on our brains to call them up when we need them. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. I think it's one of the things that we underestimate. And it's probably one of the lessons I hope our generation learns. Mm. That just like the muscles that we train and we we take to yoga and we take to the gym and we run off. Our brains need exercise too. And sometimes we can pull muscles and sometimes we can have brain, what we call brain farts in our yes. house. Okay? It's like, whoa, what too. happened there? Yeah. yeah. And, but how do we put it back together? We know more now than ever before. So we no longer have to say, and we do not have to say to our parents anymore, well, that's life, isn't it? Or, well, mm-hmm. you're getting on. Or, well, what do you expect? Yeah. Those don't serve us anymore. We no, know too totally much to, to take on that. And I think we have to understand that we can't tolerate levels of pain and levels of stress long-term. No. More and more and more, that's not okay. Yeah. And that we pay, just like you were talking about yoga, whispering and speaking and then yelling. Mm-hmm. And it, it, 
we can actually create environments where it's so hard for us to backtrack yeah. that we've set ourselves up for failure. And yeah. our bodies aren't made for that. Our bodies are made to succeed. You said to me um, about, we were talking about safety and how our brains are constantly monitoring um, as we as we go throughout our, our day. You know, you had talked about this on um, on a, a Facebook Live that we did over in mm. the Centered Mama Project's virtual village. And if anyone is listen, who's listening hasn't yet been there, just hop onto Facebook and type in Centered Mama Project virtual village or just virtual village. I don't think there's another one on there. Um, and you can get in there and join the, join the village. I'd love to have you in there. And Edie and I had a conversation. We were talking about um, how every single time you come into a new situation, your brain is scanning for to make sure that you're safe and also scanning for those points of reference that will mean that you have the resources that you need to keep yourself safe and to succeed in that environment. And so you were talking about how as you're getting ready to leave the house with your kids and getting them to school on time and the traffic and do you have all the stuff that needs to go to the drug cleaner? Did you get your bag and are you, have you got your phone and the charger and the assignment from work that you took home and the, the lunch and the snack and the permission slip and da but what your brain is actually doing as you're opening that door is none of that. What your brain is actually doing is as you open the door going, is it safe to go through? And if I do, what can I count on to keep myself safe? Right? Yeah. And what can I, what in your case with taking kids out, it's the same. So what do all my people, my little people need too? Yeah. And what we don't actually think about as we're doing that is when we walk outside the door, our bodies, our skin is taking in information that's feeding to our brains about how cold or hot it is, mm. right? All the little nuances. Do I have the right shoes on? Do I have the keys in my hand that I normally have? Do I have the eyeglasses? Do I have, mm -hmm. and do I need then to reassess anything based on the information that's just been provided for me? Mm. So if you're running three or four or five minutes late, <laughs> The brain is then going, okay, so your black and white Legos in the front are going, come on, come on, come on, we got to hurry, you're going to be late. As is right? your mouth, I'm, <laughs> I can attest, yeah. <laughs> I'm so glad I don't have to talk in that period. Maybe that's one of the benefits of not being a mama. Oh, yeah. I should also learn to just not talk in that. I, sometimes, I'll, <laughs> sometimes I just work with gestures, which are not very um, zen-like often, but um, sometimes I will actually literally zip my lip and just be like, I'm not talking. I'm just, this is okay, not so going to go well. <laughs> one of the best things that you can do for your brain to actually trigger and train it to succeed is to replace something with something. Mm. Our brain's really good at hearing us say, I am actively making a decision that this is in my better interest. And so I'm going to do X. Like humming so, or something. Singing. Oh exactly. Yeah. Whistling while you work. Right. Yeah. I do sometimes, sometimes I'll do the like, let's put our shoes on and get out the door <laughs> because if we're late, it's going to suck. Okay. Well, let's talk about that cognitively because that's a fun one, right? So if you're yelling at somebody, then you're actually creating a space where they're feeling threatened and not safe, mm -hmm. right? So then the brain is going, oh my God, now I can't problem solve because my priority is actually to be included and to please the person that I love and, cl and who's clearly feeling awful. threatened. And this is oh, frustrating, oh. but it's life and it's actually a lesson, right? So they're, right. they're processing just like we are. Yeah. But if you're singing, the brain is going, oh, wait a minute, I'm not actually being triggered by any sort of threat. This is open and engaging and I'm storing information, including mm. music. Mm. And suddenly it's inclusive. So, so there's, a, there's a great video on Facebook of a guy cycling home on a busy European bridge where there's clear defined lanes of, you know, pedestrian and cycles, but there's tons of tourists and they're from all over the world and they're in the, his way. And you can see he's done this a variety of times and we know what doesn't work, right? Is stopping, yelling, doing all of that. So he sings. He sings in his operatic voice that he's coming through and that they need to get out of his way. And that it's, and they're all looking at him because they're hearing this music that is so absurd in the situation. Yeah. And by, through his body language, then seeing what he needs them to do. So interesting. I'm going to try to find that link and I'll put it in the show notes for anyone who's listening. Or if you know what really you know it is. I'll see if I can find it. Yeah. yeah I was just so pulling good. it up recently. Yeah. yeah that would be, be fun. fun. But that's the kind of thing though I'd really like to leave you with yeah. is if you replace something, your brain is really, really good at holding on to that. 
and then moving into success. And I think that really needs to be the message, right? And we're always going to experience load and overload, right? That's life. Yeah. It's what we do with it. And if we can give our brains the tools and resources to succeed, it'll be our best friend. And the same with our kids. If we can set them up to succeed instead of always going to the negative, which is what our brain is wired to do, look for the danger. So look for the negative. If we can rewire our brains, which I can tell you 44 years in plus a few days, it's an effort to rewire the the wiring you don't even know is there, right? And, And the wiring that you didn't, you were confident was never a part of your being until you become (laughs) responsible for small humans that you love more than anything you could ever imagine. And then all of a sudden, there's a whole aspect of yourself that, you know, and and I'm sure you don't, I mean, you are an auntie and you have small humans in your life, both around the world, but also you have small humans that you encounter in your work with families and, and just, you know, we, we have opportunities to learn and evolve and grow being around small humans that are like nothing else, whether they're yours or they're not. It, it's always an opportunity to, to evolve and grow. And I really love that as a, as a leaving message from you to, mm. to set yourself up for success, set your brain up for success. Cause it really, really wants to do that for you. And we can do the same thing for everyone around us, whether it's our aging parents or our children, Yeah. I I couldn't nod more. Oh, and I couldn't, I would, as ever, I always say this at the end of one of my podcasts, but I would love to have you back because there's, I literally just had a note, little page of notes that we've made while talking before. And I think we've hit about a third of the things we could could talk about, but I, I appreciate you being game to come on the Mama Feel podcast and talk all things cognitive health and yeah, I just know that everyone who's listening is going to get so many nuggets. And if they would like more nuggets, or if there are families who are in a situation, which many of us are or will be, of having someone in our in our environment, whether they be family or friends or neighbors or colleagues, who are experiencing a decline in cognitive health, can they find you somewhere? Can they? Yeah, absolutely. Well, they can find us at, let's find me at the Centered Mama for a little while, right? Yeah, in the virtual village. Yeah, because you're in there a little bit now. Yeah. Yeah. But I'm also on Facebook and I'm online. You can find me pretty much anywhere. And if you can't find me from my name, you can look up Dementia and Cambridge and find me. Toot sweet. Yeah, yeah. Well, well, I'll put links in the show notes. So for anyone who... That would be great. Yeah. And And I'm happy to help. That's the whole idea is that we get more information about these things so that we're aiming for success. Yeah. And not decline. That's just not fair for anybody. Yeah. And what, I mean, one of the key ways of ensuring success or setting yourself up for success is to make sure that you're well supported in, in the community. And I often say it takes a village to raise a child, but it also takes a village to support a mom or a caregiver. It's yeah. Or a grandparent who's in need, yeah. right? We're more and more isolated and we don't benefit from that at all. Yeah. So can I just say kudos to you for creating this community? It's Thank beautiful you. and really, really fun and important. I can't believe. I wish my mom had something like that, right? I mean, wouldn't our moms have benefited from experiences like that where we could dip in and find women who are role modeling and being human? I think it's just great what you're doing. Please continue. Thank you. Fantastic work. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, what's been so lovely. And maybe we'll have you back another time. That would be fun, but it's great to stay in touch, Anne. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye for now. Bye-bye. That's it for this episode of Mama Fuel, the podcast. Thanks for listening. There's a lot more conversation, sharing, and real mama talk happening in our private Facebook group. To join in, go to www.thecenteredmamaproject.com forward slash Facebook. And be sure to say hello when you get there. Can't wait to see you. If you like this episode, or if you know a mama who could use a little mama fuel, I'd love you to share this episode and to rate and leave a review. Every comment helps, and it's always a delight to hear from you. Thanks, and bye for now.